In this video presentation, I'll talk about morphologic changes and typical complications after MI in different time spans. So let's first start with the case. In this case, a 55-year-old Caucasian male is brought to the ER with sudden onset severe substernal chest pain, as well as sweating and mild dyspnea. The pain does not respond to aspirin or sublingual nitroglycerin. His past medical history is significant for, hyper for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. If uh, an ECG done and the ECG demonstrates ST segment elevation in leads 1, AVL, and V1 to V3 with deep Q wave development over the next several hours. Now, cardiac catheterization in this patient would most likely show which of the following. So, pick an answer. Okay. So, my answer will be ulcerated atherosclerotic plaque with partially obstructive thrombus. So, why is so? First of all, you see that the patient has typical symptoms and signs of MI, which is chest pain, sweating and dyspnea, which is not relieved by aspirin and nitroglycerin, and the patient have all the risk factors for development of atherosclerosis. And then the patient have typical ECG features of uh, MI, which is acid segment elevation, and also deep QF development which also tells us that this MI is not only subendocardial but it's, all, it's mainly transmural. So in case of transmural MI, this, it occurs due to mainly a full obstruction of a coronary artery. And full obstruction of coronary artery occurs after an ulcerated plaque. Actually, uh, in, in, in the place of ulcerated plaque, there is formation of thrombus. And that thrombus actually causes the obstruction leading to a transmural infarction. So the answer is this C. So myocardial infarction is most often due to uh, thrombosis uh, as a result of rupture of coronary artery atherosclerotic plaque. So this rupture actually invites the platelets and then the platelet forms a thrombus which causes the infarction. And if there is a transmural infarction, the ECG commonly shows ST elevation and Q waves. So this is called ST elevation MI. If the infarction is subendocardial, the ECG normally shows ST depressions. Those are called NSTMI or non ST elevated MI. And in case of non ST elevated MI, the main diagnostic uh, feature, uh, main diagnostic clues are cardiac biomarkers like troponin I and CKMB. We have another case here. So, a 59 year old African American male presents to the emergency room with crushing chest pain, sweating, and lightheadedness. His blood pressure is 90 over 60 millimeters of mercury and his heart rate is about 48 beats per minute. Electrocardiogram shows sinus bradycardia and ST segment elevation in leads 2, 3 and AVF. Occlusion of the which of the following coronary arteries is most likely responsible for this patient's symptom. You can pick an answer, pausing for a moment. Okay, so let me pick the answer. So this patient actually presented with acute inferior MI. Why inferior? Because first of all you have the ST segment elevations in lead 2 3 AVF. So, those leads 2 3 AVF are call, also called inferior leads. And you have some other clues too, which are actually which are decreasing blood pressure. So, commonly, if there is an inferior MI, there is decrease in blood pressure. And also, there is some bradycardia in inferior MI. So, all the clues actually tells you that this is an inferior MI. And the inferior surface of the heart is actually mainly supplied by the right coronary artery. So, the answer should be right coronary artery. So the most commonly occluded arteries in MI are left anterior descending artery, right coronary artery, and circumflex artery. And the common symptoms of MI are diaphoresis or sweating, nausea and vomiting. So all of those are due to parasympathetic or sympathetic overactivity. And the most important symptom is severe crushing or squeezing substernal or retrosternal pain. And this pain can radiate to left arm or jaw or even head or epigastrium and there can be also shortness of breath due to sympathetic hyperactivity and fatigue. We have another case here. A 56 year old man with a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia is brought to the emergency de department with chest pain, diaphoresis and lightheadedness. His symptoms started an hour ago while he was stacking boxes in his garage. He describes the pain as 
tight squeezing sensation in the center of his chest that radiates down his left arm. Electrocardiogram shows ST segment elevations in lead 2, 3 and AVF. The tissues affected by this patient's acute condition will most likely develop which of the, which of the following histologic changes over the next few days. You can pick the answer, it's very easy. So the answer is coagulative necrosis. So the case actually de describes a typical, very typical case of inferior MI and in case of MI and most of the solid organ infarctions, the infarction or necrosis is coagulative necrosis. So it's a very easy question. Now we have another case. A 45 year old man comes to the emergency department because of severe chest pain, diaphoresis and palpitations. The patient dies two hours after the onset of his symptoms. Autopsy reveals 100% occlusion of the left anterior descending artery. At the time of patient's death, light microscopy of the unaffected myocardium, light microscopy of the affected myocardium would most likely demonstrate which of the following. That's also an easy question. So the answer of this question is normal myocardium. So we have the reasons uh, in the later slides. So I am telling you the basic reason. So this patient died after two hours of after onset of symptoms. So in case of MI, there is no gross or microscopic changes appear before four hours. So it takes about four hours for development of gross and microscopic changes after an event of MI. So that's why in after two hours, you will have a normal myocardium, just normal. We have another case here. A 57 year old man dies 30 minutes after the onset of chest pain while driving to the emergency department. So he didn't reach the emergency department. His past medical history was significant for hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and hypercholesterolemia. His medication included metformin, simvastatin, and inlapril. A cross section of this left anterior descending artery, le left anterior descending coronary artery is shown on the image below. So here is a cross section of the LED. Now, which of the following is the most likely cause of death in this patient? So the cause of death in this patient is most likely ventricular fibrillation. Why is so? First of all, this case actually tells you the typical presentation of a patient with MI with all the risk factors like diabetes and hypercholesterolemia and also hypertension because you have inalaprine in the treatment regimen. And you have a complete occlusion of the left coronary artery which actually confirms that this patient surely had myocardial infarction. And in case of myocardial infarction, the most common, most common cause of death in the pre-hospital phase or the early phase is arrhythmia and most commonly ventricular arrhythmia. So this patient most likely died from ventricular arrhythmia. So in the timeline of 0 to 4 hours or the first 4 hours, there is no gross or microscopic change. Because in case of coagulative necrosis, in the early times, there is actually preserved architecture for some duration. And the most common complications uh, in the first four hours are arrhythmia. And this is actually the most common cause of death in MI in patients with pre-hospital phase. And next important complication is heart failure. This is the most common cause of death during in-hospital phase. And another cause of death is cardiogenic shock. In the next four to 24 hours or in the next 24 hours, there is some, now there is some gross and macroscopic changes. And the gross changes include dark mottling. And this dark mottling can become pale with the addition of tetrazoleum stain. And the light microscopic feature starts to show that early features of coagulative necrosis. And the necrotic cells actually now starts to release necrotic content into the blood. And there is edema due to inflammatory infiltration. And there is hemorrhage and also there is oil fiber. And uh, neutrophil starts to appear and they actually starts to increase in number and here now if they are if a patient receives reperfusion therapy it can cause reperfusion injury and there may be formation of contraction bands and those occur due to mainly free radical damage and the complications in this period are same in the first four hours like the first four hours which are arrhythmia heart failure and cardiogenic shock so let's talk about another case here we have a 65 year old caucasian male admitted following an acute ST segment elevation MI. He experiences chest pain on day 4 of his hospitalization. He described the pain as sharp in quality, adds that it increases with coughing and swallowing and radiates to his neck. The blood pressure of this patient is 130 over 80 mmHg 
Pulse is 90 beats per minute and the temperature is 101 degree Fahrenheit and the respirations are 20 beats per minute. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's chest pain? So pause for a minute, pick your answer. Okay, I'm picking my answer now. So here the answer is C. So pericardial inflammation, inflammation overlying the necrotic segment of myocardium. So why is so? First of all, this patient had MI about four days ago. So four days have passed from, from MI. And now this patient develops some typical features of pericarditis, which are sharp pain, which increases with coughing and swelling. And pericarditis about four days after MI should suggest that this is actually an inflammatory reaction overlying the necrotic segment of myocardium. So that's why C is the answer. So in the first three days or one to four days, the gross, gross appearance of the heart is hyperemic. So there is increased blood flow to heart uh, or increased blood flow to the necrotic area. And then microscopic features should sh so show that there is extensive coagulative necrosis and there is increasing number of neutrophils causing acute inflammation. And the most important complication in this phase is post-infarction fibrous pericarditis which commonly occurs in the day 2 to 4. We have another case here. A 62-year-old Caucasian female hospitalized with acute myocardial infarction died suddenly on day 4 of her hospitalization. Findings at autopsy are pictured below. So here you can see the right ventricle and the LAD. Now the question is why does that happen and what actually happened? So as you can see here this picture shows an obstruction in the LAD so actually it doesn't show it mainly shows that there is an rupture of the ventricular wall in the apical region so there is ventricular free wall rupture and this actually occurs due to formation of granulation tissue and activation of macrophages and those macrophages actually causes weakening of the myocardium and also weakening of the other areas of the heart and this leads to this weakening actually ultimately can lead to rupture of the free wall. We have another case here a 60 year old man develops acute substernal chest pain, sweating and nausea. ECG shows acute ST elevation in leads 2, 3 and IVF. Reperfusion therapy is not given due to underlying cirrhosis and history of variceal bleeding. He is diagnosed with a myocardial infarction and is eventually discharged from the hospital with conservative treatment. Twelve days after his myocardial infarction, he is found dead on the floor of his apartment. Light microscopy would most likely reveal which of the following changes in the affected myocardium. Pausing for a moment, pick your answer. Okay, now I am picking my answer. So my answer will be fibrovascular granulation tissue with neovascularization. So this patient with typical features of MI and a specific diagnosis of MI dies after 12 days. So when 12 days pass, uh, he's, he al already have developed some granulation tissue overlying the uh, dead myocardium. So that, that should tell you that there is fibrovascular granulation tissue with neovascularization. So that process actually completes within day 14 and after day 14 there is actually start, start of formation of collagenous scar. So in the 3 to 4 days or 4 to 14 days the gross feature shows that the borders of necrotic myocardium are hyperemic and now in the center of the myocardium there is yellow brown softening and the maximal yellow brown softening occurs by 10 days. And that's why, that's why actually the myocardium may rupture in the early phases. And the macroscopic change shows that there is increased macrophage, which actually brings out and starts the formation of granulation tissue at the margin, which actually co progressively increases in amount. And the most common complication in this phase is free wall rupture, and which can cause cardiac tamponade. And the same complication, same softening can cause papillary muscle rupture leading to mitral regurgitation interventricular septal rupture and all of those phenomena occurs due to increased activity of macrophage which actually causes degradation of the uh, necros myocardium and the patient can also develop left ventricular pseudoaneurysm because the granulation tissue that is developing in in place of necrotic myocardium is very weak and that's why it can lead to a development of a pseudoaneurysm and which also can rupture and the two weeks to several months after the mi the gross Pathology shows recanalized artery and the gray-white color of the uh, necrotic myocardium. 
and the macroscopic features show that there is formation of collagenous scar which is starting to complete and the complication the most important complications in after two weeks or after 14 days is restless syndrome so restless syndrome actually can occur uh, from one week to four weeks after an mi and other complications that can occur in this period are heart failure arrhythmias true ventricular aneurysm which also leads to carries a risk of developing moral thrombus so that's all from me today thanks all for watching my video